Okay, let's get started. <coughs> um, my name is Dave Packham. I work for the University of Utah. Um, during the day, I'm an IT guy-ish, and at night, I like to blow stuff up when they're flying in the air. Um, so that's got me into this hobby. Um, we actually do have uh, a competition that's called Game of Drones. And if you guys go out and Google that, you'll see that we actually do cage fighting with drones. Um, and it's sort of cool. If you do it around people, you have, there's some r rules, like you can't shoot anything, nothing explosive. Um, everything has to be self-contained and you have to fly in this this gilded cage, right? Um, but if when we fly out like in the West Desert and we're several hundred yards away from the drones when they're at battle, uh, shotgun shells, portable nukes, whatever you can put on your craft, it's all go. So, um, so everybody know what an ID-10T error is? Yes. So, um, I, I am a proponent of calling these things UAVs for unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, drone, to me, is the gray thing that the military shoots down or shoots with uh, in unfortunate circumstances that they need to do that kind of thing. Um, these would be drones in my classification, uh, the bottom one being the Predator type drone, um, remotely piloted vehicle, things like that. Uh, my world is a little less crazy, unless you factor in the shotgun shells. Um, I like to build, fly, tweak, modify, design anything that flies with multiple blades. Uh, the reason for that is because I like the software and the engineering that goes behind it and the physics that, that happen. The math, I get really lost in really quick, so I'm not a math major. Um, and this is really massive level math to get these kind of calculations going on. But I love, I love flying these things, I love building these things. Um, as a matter of fact, I've been doing this for you know five, six years, and this is the first commercial um, drone that I've ever, UAV, see? I, I watch the news and it affects me. Um, this is the first commercial UAV I've ever purchased, and it's actually a Chinese clone of this 3DR Solo. Uh, the 3R Solo is about a thousand dollar device. Uh, the DJI Phantom is about a thousand dollar device. Those are all the white drones. Drones. These people, UAVs are flying around. Uh, like they dropped the DJI Phantom on the president's front lawn. Uh, you know, they fly it through national parks, things like that. That's where the ID10T error comes into the sport. So this is actually a Chinese clone of this thousand dollar device. And the Chinese clone cost me $125 shipped. Yes. Okay. Remote clicker. Yay. Okay. Good. Now I'm not tethered. I'm free to fly. And I don't have to stand right in front of the lake. Wow. Okay. So, um, so $125. Uh, it's called the Cheerson CX20 slash rebranded quantum quantum with no T Nova uh, and it you know you have to provide your own radio um, but I bought the Chinese clone radio for $49 um, it's completely open source software you can reprogram every switch on the face um, back in the day you know people used to fly spectrums Futabas US built types and this switch only did this one thing and this knob only did this one thing and this, you know, you only had so many channels, you had only so many frequencies, you could only do what was in the box. Um, open source world came into it, started making clones. It's an AT mega chip, write your own software. You could make the switches turn left or do a flip or drop a payload or whatever you wanted to do. Okay, so very flexible. Um, everything I work with, except with the exception of that one, uh, is open source. Um, we started out in the day. There's no, I don't think there's a laser in this one. Uh, we started out in the day with the upper left there, using uh, towel curtain rods from Home Depot. That's what the arms were made out of. Um, my first quadcopter actually had Tupperware on the top. 
turned over, so I'd secure the lid and I'd pop the top on and off. And uh, it was a couple months before my wife put two and two together and figured out that piece of Tupperware was missing because it was flying. Um, she also didn't notice that the first time I built one, back in it was like 2010, 2011, uh, I hadn't tightened down the propeller, right? As tight as I thought it needed to be. And the first time I spun it up was inside the house when my family was gone. <coughs> and the propeller shot up to our 18-foot ceiling and embedded itself in the drywall. I didn't have an 18-foot ladder, so there was probably two months of dinner time that went by until someone went, what is that? <laughs> I don't know. I forgot. Um, but the open sourceness and the, and the commodity of this, this hobby has opened up a lot of crazy wackadoodles. Um, this gentleman right here built uh, a quadcopter. Okay, it's got 54 motors. Oops, there's any mathematicians that know what 54 is in Latin. Octodecum something something. Copter. And, you know, it's got motor, prop, battery hanging down, just like this quadcopter. He's using the exact same flight processor flight controller that I am. He's got a knob on one hand to turn the speed of the, of the motors up and down. And he's got a joystick that does PPM that he that he plugged into his transmitter, which he's sitting on, okay? And then the, the, the yellow stuff underneath his butt is actually foam. So he planned for a hard landing. But this thing actually flew. Uh, he flew around quite aggressively on his first flight. And you could hear whoever was at the camera, probably his wife, going, ah, what are you doing? Ah, no, ah. And he's like, I got this, I got this. He had a helmet on. And... Um, you know, this was the second attempt. The first attempt I saw of someone actually flying a, a pre-built one, the guy was actually on top of the blades, sitting on top, and there was a, one of those bouncy balls that no one ever sits on that we all have at our desk. Um, that's what was his landing gear. And I'm like, why would you put yourself above 54 10,000 RPM carbon fiber stilettos? Okay, so at least this guy got it right. He's below it. But this is, the, you know, this is what opens it up. 326 pounds this thing can lift, right? You got to charge 54 batteries, you know, which will probably suck the life out of your Prius. But, you know, one flight, 10 minutes, you're flying. Seriously. Okay? So UAV versus drone. You know, I call them UAVs. I slip sometimes because the media has got me going south. Um, so you want to fly, right? Uh, we've all gotten those little cheap helicopters for Christmas that, you know, fly straight up and get sucked into the ceiling or fly sideways and hit a kid. Um, those are not a good uh, corollary to, to flying these things. Uh, anything that uses infrared or the little cheap controllers and bounces radio waves off your inside of your house are very sluggish, very hard to maneuver, things like that. You need to, you need to make a jump into at least a... $100, $200 device. Um, I actually got my kids last year the Air Hog X4. It's a little quadcopter about this big. It's all foam. It's got four little red rotors and it's got a little controller. That actually flies pretty well. And, you know, you can bump into the stuff and nothing dies. Um, but here's the problem. Of course, our government had to stick their nose into it, right? Because we have a plethora of ID10 T errors. Right? People, wh whose grandpappy flew RC models? Everybody's grandpappy flew RC models, right? Everybody's grandpappy, you know, built something out of balsa wood. You know, they put, they put explosives on them. They did all this kind of stuff a bazillion years ago, right? But, you know, you had to be an engineer to do this kind of thing, right? Nowadays, you can go to Costco, buy a drone, take it home and fly it, right? And then you're smart enough, obviously. You live in New York in a high rise. You think, oh, I'm just gonna fly this out my window. Because you know, Manhattan Park's like 10 hours away. So you put a GoPro on it to identify everything you're doing. You fly it out your window and you don't think of things like turbulence. You don't think of things about GPS reflections from other buildings. You don't think, you know, it's a serious ID10T error. 
and the drone goes flying around. And in this case, I would call it a drone because it's an idiot controlling it, probably. And it hits the side of a building and falls, hits a guy in the head. They sue him. He loses. Bad name for all of us, right? So the FAA stuck its nose in, and not a big fan of what they're trying to do, but we're going to talk about it. If you're a commercial person and you want to fly and do real estate photos and you want to spend $4,000 on a UAV, you know, you're not going to be stupid about it, right? But we've got to figure out a way to control these people who can buy them at Costco. So the FAA, in all their wisdom, came up with a great way to do this. <laughs> and they announced just recently that they want people to register their aircraft. Okay? They want people, and this is a the quote, there can be no accountability if a person breaking the rule can't be identified. Yeah. So if you can't find me, why would I put a tag on my drone? UAV. Okay? So they put together a task force, and the, actually it was Congress or somebody on the Hill said, back in 2012, said, we're going to give the FAA a new chunk of money, and we're going to say, okay, you need to regulate this airspace. You need to come up with something before the end of 2015. So they wait until two months before the end of 2015 and said, oh, well, we're going to do something. We're going to do something. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask all of you to put this little device, I mean, I've heard many ranges of what this device is going to look like. We're going to have some kind of identifier on there. And we're going to make you use it. Okay? Because we're going to sell a million drones before Christmas. Right? Probably are. Right? And every kid's going to go out on the 31st and fly these things into the side of their house. And, you know, some of them are actually going to go to the park um, you know, and do these kind of things. So the FAA wants to regulate it, okay? They faced a lot of heat from the House, uh, the House Transportation Subcommittee, right, by not issuing laws and rules and jumping ahead of this a long time ago. Um, and the deadline was set in 2012, and they just sort of, sort of winging it right now. So is this good? Is it not good? This is a, an interesting video, and I'm going to skip through some of this. Now, I'm not saying this is good. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm saying this is a really cool use for it. Um, this is a gentleman that we, that we associate with. He actually, um, if you notice, you might recognize some of this. He actually, that right down there and the, to the left is Pleasant Grove Cemetery slash Park. And what he's going to do, he's got a wing, a foam wing, and he's going to make a six kilometer try at flying up to Mount Timpanogos, right? Now let's see if I can, um, how do we go further? Oh, great. All right, well, I can't actually see the controls to get it going anywhere else. Anyway, so that's what he does. He flies all the way up to that snow-capped mountain, and then he glides all the way back down. It's a very beautiful view, right? But I, um, and you can Google this. It's on YouTube, um, Mount Timpanogos FPV, first-person view. So what he's wearing goggles, he's sitting down in a chair, and he, this is what he sees as he's flying his craft, right? So you got the fly, flying feeling. Well, I showed this to my neighbor who's a private pilot. And he said, you know, I take my family up every once in a while, and I fly out of Spanish Fork, and I fly around the, the peak of Timpanogos. And he's like, this, it would really suck if I hit one of these type thing. And then we started thinking and talking back and forth and saying, okay, you know, what are the odds of a small foam wing, something with you know, that size or a little bit bigger? actually hitting a plane in 3D space, 
Like, we've all watched Star Wars, and it's, you know, three spaces, X, Y, and Z, and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, you know, my plane hits birds, and that doesn't do much, you know, unless there's, you know, explosives or something in the, in the, in the attempt. Um, so, so it wasn't really a big thing to him. And then you hear on the news, you hear, oh, you know, JetBlue or Delta spotted a drone flying, you know, 100 feet away. They have never, ever once identified the craft, identified it if it wasn't a bird or something else. And all of a sudden, people are flying these drones over the airport? I mean, if I was a kid, that's the last place I'd go. Well, I don't know. Maybe you think the airport is the place you do go to fly drones, UAVs. Right, but there's never in all these hundreds and hundreds of sightings, they've never actually s identified that it's a craft. They just say, oh, it looks like a DJI. Or it looks like this little white thing. It was flying 150 feet over here, and I saw it for about you know split second as I was screaming by at 600 miles an hour. Now, let's have great eyesight, but I'm a little dubious. You know, maybe not. So, you know, not that I want a drone UAV to hit a commercial airliner and take it down. That would really suck. Okay? But we have to, you know, figure out what's true, what's right. So, uh, they're going to require recreational drone operators to register the craft. Okay? They're going to try to make some except exemptions, hopefully for those little toy copters that you fly inside your house that can't go above 10 feet before they auto-destruct, right? But what they're asking you to do, and the rumors I've heard, is they're asking you to buy this dongle device that has GPS, GSM for cell transmission, et cetera, et cetera, and will beacon you know, like a black box, it'll beacon, you have to power it on your drone battery, it'll beacon your code, your ham radio license name, or whatever, and every time you're in the air, it'll beacon your GPS location in your flight, and the FAA will see it on the radar, and they'll have a bazillion more dots to look at, right? But, seriously, if, you know, and if they're not enforcing it, or if they are enforcing it, are the local police officers going to run around and say, hey, you have a craft that took off from the ground. You, you have a beacon on it. No, it's a paper airplane. Seriously, come on. And they do have really cool kits for paper airplanes that are remote control. It's this little box with a carbon fiber rod and a prop, and you put it on a paper airplane, and you can go left and right. It's a really cool paper airplane drone. Okay? So it's going to be an opt-in service, but it's going to be, um, and you'll be hit with a penalty if you fly without beaconing your license. Okay, so who knows how much this device is going to cost? Who knows how much taxes will go up if, if they pay for it instead of us? And then if I'm, you know, testing in my backyard for five minutes, do I have to call the airport and file a flight plan? If I, you know, let's say I'm somebody who works for a vendor that was out front and I take my drone and I fly it in a national park where I'm not supposed to, right? And I crash into the side of a big magnificent something. Um, and no one's around. Did anyone hear it? The drone fell and no one heard it. Okay, so there's a lot of not real clear information coming out with drones. Who's going to register? Okay. Everybody in this room, we're all Utahns, we all own handguns, right? Or AR-16s or semi-automatic weapons, because that's just what Utah does, right? And we've registered all of our weapons. Okay, I get that, you need a license. Okay, we go fishing, you need a license. I go fly in the park, so are they going to regulate frisbees? No? But it's nearly impossible to find someone who's unregistered. And then he says, only the good guys will register. It's like, yeah, that's our problem with pretty much everything in the government, right? So, why would we want to register? Well, first of all, we've got to ask, can they actually do this? 
Okay, there's this guy, Joseph Mitchell Lamamamakoa, something like that, said, and he's, a, he's an aviation attorney, and he said, uh, no, the FAA does not have authority to register recreational drone operators to fly aircraft that weigh less than 55 pounds. And it's been like this for eons in the FAA. Anything under 55 pounds forever has been classified a non-threat to the FAA, right? But now they want to take things that weigh less than a pound and regulate these things. I mean, they, they could start regulating knives and forks and spoons, that, you know, or, oh my gosh, let's not talk about model rockets, they don't exist. You know, in the parks, how many, how many Cub Scouts have poked their eyes out on a water bottle? Let's ban two-liter water bottles, okay? So he works at this airport, and he's like, you know, okay, so prove it to me. Prove to me that you've actually seen drones and had near misses. And, you know, there's, there's pilots out there that are saying they were cruising at 4,000 feet, and they saw a drone. Okay, well, let's, let's, we're, not, we're all physicists, physics majors here. You get this craft at 4,000 feet, which I guarantee you it can do. I'm not going to tell you how I know that. It's called cloud surfing, and you can Google that. My name is not associated with it. But under a phantom account, you can get these things up to 4,000 feet. But what speed is a plane traveling, especially a commercial jet, when they hit 4,000 feet? And would they even be able to see that or differentiate it from a speck of cloud? So that's what this lawyer is saying. He's saying, you, you can't tell me that you're seeing these things at 4,000 feet. Really? I mean, are you a bat? you got, like, eagle eyes? You can see mice on top of hills? Okay, probably not. So, i, I got to warn you, this next slide you may not want to see. So if you don't like seeing gross things, you can close your eyes. Okay. We all know who this is, right? The Hannah Montana Miley Cyrus. Okay. She got droned. That's what the newspaper said. About a month ago, she tweeted a small video of a white drone flying over her house to try and get pictures of her in her Hollywood home. Okay. So we're worried about this person, and we're enacting regulation and law in Hollywood city limits now that says you cannot fly 375 feet spherically around any famous person's home. But only famous people, right? Because you do have to do this to be famous. Anyways, <coughs> so... The paparazzi are no longer able to operate drones over Hannah Montana's house. It's such a loss. Just anybody famous. Okay. Kardashians. Uh, you, you know, anyone inside the city limits of Bel Air? The Fresh Prince? I don't know. If, if you're on the bus route, a yeah, drone cannot fly over your head. The celebrities will need to register their makeup with the FAA. Let me remind you. Okay. So, <clears throat> back to normal. And this this was just sort of flabbergasting, if I could use those words, after tea and crumpets. The English actually passed a law that said, okay, look at this. Divorce lawyers hope to use drones to check for cheating people. Helicopter parents have a new term. There are actually people that fly their UAVs out to watch their kids walk to the bus stop and back. Possibly cool use of technology. 
I don't know if I'd want to fly around a bunch of little kids. An American legislature is trying to get all these privacy issues figured out, including paparazzi drones and the whole Hannah Montana Institute, and excuse me, the whole Hannah Montana problem. In Britain, they just came out and said, hey, yo, um, so small remote control aircraft can fly in any normal airspace and in any airspace for private use, but are required to stay 150 feet away from other people and buildings and 450 feet away from public assemblies. Please adhere to this. And, if, and we're done. You know, so I can fly in my backyard. I can't go over and take pictures of my neighbors. You know, I can fly in the city park. And I can't fly near groups of people. You know, there have been confirmed sightings of drones flying around fires. You know, and the bomb, the, you know, the helicopters that come in have to pull out and say, hey, you know, saw this thing. And they actually have photographs of photographers and news stations that come in and they want to take pictures. They got their $8,000 drone in the air and they're taking these pictures and the helicopter pilots have to back off. ID-10 Pierre, please, people. Right there. Britain figured it out. How come we can't figure it out? Didn't we leave them? Okay, so what can fly? Okay. Copters. Any kind. Multi-six. 10, 12, 57, 2, 1 copters, okay? Planes. You can put the same flight controller I have in my quadcopter or my hexacopter inside a plane, and you can tell it to do routes. Okay, I have a friend that does, he does rock quarry investigations for people who own massive rock quarries. And in the past, he used to go and fly all over the world. He would pay $50,000 to an helicopter pilot and say, here's a bunch of GoPros, I'm going to strap them to the bottom of your craft and I want you to fly this path over the quarry and then I want you to bring it back. I got all the data and uh, I've got all this software that stitches everything together and I'm going to tell the quarry operator how much rock he mined and I'm also going to give him a map of here's this color rock here and here's this color rock here and you've got this much color rock here left and all this kind of stuff. And they pay him you know, $80,000 for this and he drives off. Well, he went out and bought, you know, two $4,000 hexacopters. And now he flies and charges the same amount of money, right? Doesn't have to have a helicopter pilot. He's got a couple of Pelican cases. He opens them, plugs everything together, takes out his laptop, sets in the GPS waypoints, and says, go. $80,000, please. Okay? He's now using planes to fly over crops for farmers, multiple acres, thousands of acres. And if you use an infrared camera, you can actually tell where you need certain chemicals, where you need to fertilize, where certain areas that need water. So instead of chemicaling the entire place, they can spot chemical with the planes. So they upload this information into the big planes that crop dust, and the valves turn on and off depending on where they are and what they need. Awesome use. Rovers. There's one of the high school guys here brought his little rover. And these are pretty intelligent rovers. These things can race around buildings at 35 miles an hour, avoid obstacles, use GPS coordinates, do a whole bunch of cool things, run around your house, right? All open source software, you can use cameras, it can use vision, they can use um, LIDAR, they can use um, ultrasonics, a whole bunch of things. And helicopters. Is that helicopter pilot guy here? Right there, guy in the white shirt. He's like, oh, I got like eight helicopters. Big old 700 class. And seriously, they are a pain in the butt to fly. If you've ever flown a helicopter, doing, trying to figure out the cyclic control and all this kind of stuff, you end up upside down all the time. Okay, if you look at this helicopter, this is the inside of any normal RC model helicopter. And at the top, all the wires are coming into a flight control board, right? Which is just like this board right here. It's a little sub $100, $49 flight control board. And it takes this mean machine, and he could hand you the controls and say, okay, automatic takeoff. <laughs> Hanging out there. Push the stick forward and the quad. The, 
you know, this nasty machine that no one can fly, just sort of floats forward, floats back, floats left, floats right, right? They even have what's called simple mode. So when you're flying a craft, you always have to know where your nose is, right? So let's say I'm the craft and my pilot's behind me. Left is left, or right is right, right? But if I turn around, I'm sideways, or I face my pilot, left is now right, and right is now left, right? Well, simple mode takes all that out of the equation. You could be spinning in a circle. You can move the controller this way, and the craft will move away from you. It doesn't care which way the nose is pointing, because it knows where the GPS location of where I took off was. So the software and the math says, okay, this is where the guy is standing. He wants me to go away from him, so I'm going to move this way. I'm going to do all the math, tilt my blades to go that way. And I can just zoom in a circle and it'll zoom around me, right? The battery runs low. It takes and sets itself into autonomous mode and comes back and lands right in front of me. Great. You know, I can go up to the top of a mountain. Really cool place. I can take my drone, my UAV out. I can take my phone. I can connect to it and I can say, okay, hey, you have a family? You know, we're on the edge of this cliff right here, but let's take a droney, right? I hit a button on my phone, my craft goes up to 10 feet, and then at an angle flies away at 150, 200 feet, and then flies back to me and lands in the same spot. So if I'm on a precipice or a boat or a beach or somewhere, I can take these dronies, right? Cool technology. So you can even fly helis. So if you want a cool heli, you can do this kind of stuff. This is just for you. I put in a slide how to hook up the cyclic control, how to hook up the tail rotor. You know, it's got compass, heading, pointing. You let go of the sticks, so it'll just sit there and float until you give it input. You know, you can make them very docile, very functional. They can do the same kind of auto flights. You can say fly to here, fly to here, fly to here, fly to here. Okay? And now, the ID10T problem. Complete kits are everywhere. You can buy these at Costco. You can buy them online. You can buy them at eBay. You can buy them. You can spend $1,000. You can spend $124. They're everywhere. And it's everything you need to fly. Open up the box, plug in the battery, turn on the transmitter, don't read anything. There's a big red sticker on there that says read the book. You don't do that. You pull the sticker off. You hit the fly button, and you start mashing the controls and figuring it out. Okay. <coughs> Walmart. Amazon, years ago, said we're going to start delivering if you live within three miles of a distribution warehouse. No, I don't. Sorry. Uh, but I do probably live within three miles of, wa of a Walmart. Right? But, <coughs> wow, there's so many things I can say right now. There's you know, if I, if I get 12 GPSs locked and I take off from this position, I'm going to land here, right? That's about margin of error on commercial GPS and, or consumer GPS, not military GPS. <coughs> Am I going to go to Walmart's webpage and say, you know, I need a, another six-pack of hot dogs and an eight-pack of buns because they never match, right? Because I ran out of buns and now I got extra hot dogs. And why do you guys do this, right? So I need extra extra hot dogs to fill in the buns that I have extra. So Walmart, send me some. So they take off, and what do you do? You go to a Google map and click, okay, I do. here's a safe spot in front of my house or behind my house, go. And they take off and they rush you some hot dogs. And what are they going to Drop it from 100 feet and kill your cat <laughs> with hot dogs? That'd be, <laughs> that'd be ironic. Yeah. Or, or they actually land, you know, and, and all the kids and neighbors are, whoa, whoa, what's that? You know? And then who's to stop my next-door neighbor from shooting it? You know, because as I, as I see Amazon starting to send ship things that are only this small, they're going to start shipping, like, iPhones and watches and cool stuff, right? They throw a net in the air or something, get whatever they're doing. Anyway, so Walmart's joining in just because they can. A couple days ago, you guys saw this in the news, didn't you? A blimp, U.S. military blimp, 
with a strange, guppy looking bottom part there uh, that they didn't tell you what was in there, um, got away. So they tell me what tell me what was in this thing that they scrambled jets to follow it. Uh huh. Weather balloon, right? I'm sure they're going to spend that money, kind of money to scramble a jet. They just—I thought the Patriots deflated them. What? Yeah, yeah, they're weather balloons, right? Surveillance. Yeah, there's. <laughs> yeah, why would they scramble that much military hardware to get those things back? I don't know. Yes, it's the weather. Isn't there a Dr. Seuss book on that? The wet, the the the, the, uh, the, guy's name. the Lorax. Oh, that's something else. All right, shotguns. So um, some owners are dealing with use dealing with them with shotguns. There is a recent case of a neighbor uh, flying over what was supposedly his own airspace. His neighbor came out and shot his drone out of the sky. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of problems that happened way before this to get this kind of <laughs> to going on. So let's not even talk about that. But, okay, they went to court. A kid, a couple houses away, thought it was cool and videotaped it. And he clearly showed the drone over the guy's house, not doing a thing. There's no camera on it. He landed. The judge didn't even look at it for the video and said, huh, the guy who's got the shotgun, if it's over your house, shoot away. So now we got a precedent, right? But he didn't have an ID tag on it, so no one really knew who it was, right? Okay, maybe not. So we got this video. This is a anti-drone shoulder rifle. I can't believe how gullible people are, actually. But um, apparently what this does is it takes and sends land commands. Hey, can, you, can you barely see that drone right there? Even in HD, you can't see it at 50 feet away. So how can you see it at 4,000 feet traveling 600 miles an hour? Well, let's not go back there. Okay. Anyway, so this guy takes this uh, assault rifle, of course and points it at this drone and it commands it to land. Okay, I, I believe you could do something like this, but you're not going to command it to land. You're just going to command it to go ape nuts and just and freak out and go somewhere else and fly back to China, right? So I have yet to see one actually land. I know they took some over at DEF CON. They started playing with them. They did some command and conquer of flight, stuff like that. You know, I, I think it's an AR-16, AR-15, but, you know, there's a trigger on it, so I'm sure the guy would have shot a grenade at it if it hadn't blown off. Yep, see, there's a grenade launcher right there. Of course, it's a weather gun. It's a weather gun. So, um, the CLWS, CLAWS, whatever. Uh, Boeing created this laser, of course, we got to do cool things with lasers. And, uh, you know, they actually flew a drone, a painted gray and orange drone, over the Mojave Desert, where they're supposed to be, right? And Boeing pointed this laser at it for 10 to 15 seconds as it was flying, because, you know, at 4,000 feet, you can actually see these things flying. At it. Anyways. Um, and it caught the Cut the tail on fire with a laser. Right? Cool technology, you know, if you got 10, 15 seconds, you can do that. So, so some kind of uh, apparatus are showing up uh, attached to the bottom of weather balloons that can actually take care of this. So, do we really need to regulate all the people? Okay. So, some simple rules for RC. Okay? Don't be dumb. If you're dumb, you can leave. Okay? Don't buy 
drones for dumb people. Okay? Don't fly near airports. Don't fly over or near people. Okay? I learned that lesson a couple of Saint Cons ago, back when it was, what was it, Troy Con, something like that? No, it was like five years ago in Escalante. I, I flew my craft in front of a bunch of people like you guys. Tech Summit, yeah. And um, the front row didn't make it. My UAV took off and hovered right about here, just fine, until it decided to go full speed right into the side of the podium, which I was standing at. And pieces of prop and carbon fiber went everywhere, and it was glorious. So you don't fly near people. That's why I don't fly. You know, I'll bring my little air hog, and we can fly that. Okay, have a spotter with you. You know, my spotter is my wife. She usually falls asleep or is reading some book, but, you know, hey, at least when I'm flying your goggles, hey, can you see it? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. We tried. Okay. Check where you fly. You really don't want to fly a 2.4 gigahertz radio control device inside a building with 2.4 massive radiation. Okay? They can do crazy stuff. And every UAV that you can buy at Costco is 2.4 gigahertz. Take it out to a park where there's not 100 Wi-Fi access points. Not doing crazy stuff. Okay, there's a, um, one of the enterprising guys that, that uh, did, what was that challenge down there? The vault, yeah. He was down there and you have to get by this little uh, infrared sensor. So he pulls this out of his backpack. Of course, everybody has a small 250 size UAV in your backpack, right? <coughs> and he plugged it in. He thought, okay, so all we can do is we can hang this big cloth under it, make it look like a ghost in Halloween and scare kids. And then we can go fly it in because it's got a small, you know, cross section, radar cross section. And we can just fly and drop this cloth on the infrared sensor. And it was working awesome. It was working really good. Props to the guy. But he didn't factor in a couple of things. Okay, he's got this massive air blowing down on this big flapping sheet. So it would be like, you know, going down the freeway and holding a sheet out and not getting yanked out. Right? So he's creating his own drag. Good enough pilot, he compensated for that. Right? He got close, and we couldn't say anything. Because, you know, you have to do this competition without, hey, that's not going to work, or no, don't do that. No, anyway, so we, like, closed this glass door and let these three guys take their lives into their own hands. Then he started flying close to the walls, and then he ex experienced what's called turbulence. Prop wash, you know, ground effects. But in this case, it was a wall effect. And he was starting to suck the air down, making some turbulence. And you know, the IR sensor was in the corner, and he was going all over for it. And running out of time, so he did what any IT guy would do, and he just went go for it. Just ran into the IR sensor and took it out. <laughs> Props. It worked beautifully. And by the way, these are, these are what they call the mini quads. These are little drone racers. They actually race these now. Um, we had a drone race here about two weeks ago. And they set up these little fiberglass poles that you race around. You have cameras in the front, you wear the little goggles. And it's a drone race. It's really cool. You know, it's fun. And they're not that expensive to get into. And you can put them in your backpack just in case you need them. Okay? Um, use your brain when you're flying this kind of stuff. It's up in the air. It could hurt people. And if you don't have a brain, go play on Facebook for a while. Okay. Um, so the, the con badge that we all have, do you guys think about how, it, you know, when you flip it up, it changes the display, right? That's the same, exact same chip. It's called an accelerometer. It's the exact same chick, chip, chick, exact same chip that I use in my devices to tell if it's going left, right, up, down, right? So there is everything on this con badge that you need to either control with a joystick, because it's got a little RF thing here, 
Or you can actually put the con badge on a quadcopter and hook up some of these ports on the side. I'm pretty sure they're I2C ports and programming ports and stuff like that. And you could fly your quadcopter and it would auto level for you. Right? So instead of buying a flight controller when you get home, hack your con badge and post your con badge as the controller for a flight. And I'll give you one of my quadcopters if I see that video. Okay? So that's my challenge to you guys. You guys get one of these flying, and I've got a ready to fly kit at home I'll give you. So everything you need is in there. Everything you need is in a phone. They're actually making some kind of little quads now that you can actually stick an iPhone or an Android device in and hook it to another Android device or an iPhone. And it's got the same thing. It's got the same accelerometer, it's got the same gyro, it's got the same communication, all that kind of stuff. So all that technology is there. Go for it. Use your minds. Don't let the high school students one up you. You have time. Get the kids to bed and start doing this kind of crazy stuff. Your spouse will never know that there's something in the ceiling until months later. Okay. Last slide has some information on it. Aeroquad.com is where I got my start. It's a very open source community. Uh, you can download all the software. FPB Lab is a great place. Um, you can get all this information for flying first person video. DIY Drones is another open source um, community for the, uh, the 3DR Solo, that first commercial drone they have. Um, they have open sourced all that. Multi Recopter RC Groups is a Chinese hangout. And then my email, dave at the If you guys have any questions, concerns, comments. Um, if you want to add me to Facebook as a friend, <laughs> can't fly quads. All right. That's it. Thank you very much.